The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anoush Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. On today's show, I am welcoming back Max Simon. Max is founder and CEO of Greenflower Media, which is a cannabis education platform. He has previously worked with Deepak Chopra and has a great story, as well as a number of different projects he's working on. So we're looking forward to hearing them. Welcome, Max. How are you doing? Really good to be with you today. I'm doing very well. Thanks. Good, good. Where in the world are you? I live in Ojai, California, which is uh, just a little east of Santa Barbara. Ah, you're right at the the heart of what's going on, hopefully. So we're going to talk a bit about craft cannabis as the sort of main topic, but usually where we start is a bit about you, and you've been on the show previously, but it was actually ages ago. So for those that didn't catch that episode, it'd be great to know a bit more about yourself personally and how and why did you kind of get into the cannabis industry? Yeah, sure. Personally, I've been a medical cannabis patient for many decades. I use it daily as a medicinal tool for ADHD. And so I've had a long personal history and relationship with the plant, but I knew nothing about the cannabis industry until I got a kind of consulting gig early in 2013. And I've been in basically digital media, digital education my whole life, my whole career. Um, as you said, I worked with Deepak Chopra for about eight years building the products division and did most of the digital marketing for that business. And when I was doing this consulting gig in 2013, I really saw the enormous potential of the cannabis industry. It just struck me as this is going to be something so huge. But then it also made me realize that there was not really a legitimate source of trust of education in the space. So we started Greenflower actually as a consumer facing education platform, which we ran for many years. And while it was having a, a tremendous impact and we were reaching millions of people, that the business wasn't really doing as successfully as I wanted it to. And so about 2017, we started to kind of pivot into more professional based education, more career focused education. And that was really when Greenflower started to find its bearings as a business. And so that's kind of the story. I'm sure we can go into a little bit more about what we're doing today, but we now work with 15 different universities to power their cannabis education programs. We have a cannabis sommelier program called Ganjier, which is kind of, I think, what we're going to be focusing on today. It's really, you know, a, a training program about understanding the quality aspects of cannabis and how to provide that service to the world. And then we, a very large training provider of cannabis companies actually providing certification and training platforms for their employees. So it's been a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, there's loads there. Maybe if, if you don't mind picking up on, you mentioned that you use cannabis for your ADHD. How did you happen upon that? Were you recommended it? And, you know, was it straight away, it was the right thing? Or did you have to try and find the right cultivar that worked specifically for you, that sort of thing? I mean, I was, you know, diagnosed with ADHD very, very early on in my life because I just couldn't sit still and I was unsuccessful in school, <laughs> to say the least. And so they, you know, they prescribed me drugs and those drugs didn't work for me. They didn't make me feel good. So I didn't use them. And when I was a teenager, I just, I found cannabis as a teenager. I wouldn't have told you back in my teens and even kind of into my early 20s that I was using cannabis medicinally, but I was smoking pot every day. <laughs> and it was in hindsight, what actually allowed me to get through school. And so it was in my mid 20s that I started kind of getting a little more serious about using it medicinally. So I started consulting with doctors and I started just doing my own research. And that, that was kind of when it started to dawn on me that this was truly my medicine. You know, it was the thing that worked most effectively for me. It was the thing that helped me stay focused the best. It was the thing that helped me sleep the best. And so I kind of, yeah, self-diagnosed and self-medicated, if you will, which is still to this day what I've continued to do. Yeah, yeah. And did you find that, I mean, did you encounter stigma in, in relation to that? Did you talk to your parents or doctors and all that? Oh, yeah, of course. Even today, I, I mean, I, I went and got brain scans done at the Amen's Clinic, which is a kind of neurological center. And I was telling them about my cannabis use and they, they were quite negative against it as the leader in brain authority 
My doctors didn't. Yeah, they just basically everybody actually, nobody <laughs> supported it, to be honest with you. But it still works better for me than anything else I have tried. So, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like I had to rely on my own direct experience more so than on what anybody else was saying to me. And as I've progressed along my professional journey, and of course, now that we're kind of educating so many people about cannabis, it's made me really understand that, you know, what I felt intuitively about the value of this was just right the whole time. It's just that the society hadn't caught up to the understanding of it yet. Yeah. And I suppose you're really well placed, aren't you, to sort of understand what the things that are in cannabis that, you know, really work well for treatment of ADHD. I mean, we've now produced thousands of hours of cannabis education with physicians and nurse practitioners and specialists and, you know, everybody that kind of happens through the supply chain. So at this point, I have an unwavering certainty that not only cannabis can be used medicinally, but for many different conditions, it's one of the most effective treatments you can find. And so I have a lot of science now to back up and validate the intuitive hit that I had all along. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. And so maybe you tell us a bit more about what you're up to now. You mentioned a few things about Greenflower, but you've got Greenflower and then you've also got Gangier as well, which is another project. Would you mind sort of telling us a bit about those in, in some more detail? Yeah. So we believed that the cannabis industry would be a, a huge engine for career development, basically. So we kind of brainstormed different options for how we could actualize that as a potential and came to the conclusion that universities were the most appropriate vehicle for training people to be a part of careers. So we started approaching colleges. It was, uh, I guess we started in, we started in 2018 approaching schools. We didn't sign our first college deal until the end of 2019, actually. So it took quite a while, but we basically approached universities with this thesis that cannabis industry is growing. Nobody knows anything about it. And you can play a part in training people for that. And so once we got the first school on board and we started to develop these relationships and the programs were a success, we just kind of continued to develop those that strategy. And so now today, you know, out here in the US, we're partners with amazing schools, you know, Syracuse University, University of California, Riverside, University of Illinois, Springfield. We just announced what I think are our two biggest schools, University of Arizona and University of Denver in January. And they're great. They're these, you know, non-credit certificate programs that are offered through the university. We have a cannabis business program, a cannabis agriculture and horticulture program, all about growing the plant. We have a medical applications program all about the medical efficacy of cannabis, and then we have a law and policy program. And so it's been very exciting to work with these kind of legitimate universities in offering cannabis education. And so that's the kind of green flower side as we work with these colleges and universities on these cannabis curriculums. And then we have Gangier, which was born out of two different levels of frustration, me and the, the co-founder of it, Derek. But, you know, because of my kind of medical desire, medical intent for cannabis, I was really just fed up with how terrible the service was here in the United States in terms of the people servicing consumers. There's a kind of a dirty secret in the cannabis industry that, you know, most of the bud tenders, quote unquote, are basically non-trained hourly employees that don't know a damn thing at all. And it was really terribly frustrating for me. And so we had, you know, tried bud tender education, but that wasn't really working. And so from my side, I was trying to think of how can we create a, a training vehicle where we could empower the people that are providing this service to want to get educated, right? To want to become better, if you will. And at the same time, my co-founder, who is a multi-generational legacy craft cultivator, was watching craft cannabis get squeezed out of the marketplace by these larger companies that were producing cannabis at scale. And he was feeling quite concerned that craft cannabis and quality cannabis was just going to get pushed out of the legal framework. And so we needed some vehicle to, you know, not just make the professionals, but make the world understand the qualities of quality cannabis, you know, what, what dictates quality cannabis. And so these two problems and desires came together in the sense of saying, well, okay, if we were going to train people 
to be this kind of master of cannabis quality and service, what would that look like? And that was when we realized that those people already exist in every other kind of consumption-based industry. You know, in, in the wine industry, there's sommeliers. In the chocolate industry, there's chocolatiers. You know, there's beer sommeliers. There are trained professionals in all these different industries that are trained to understand and recognize quality and be a kind of guide for consumers in terms of what they're engaging with. And so that's what gave rise to the idea of Gangier. And then it took us almost three full years to build build this certification program. We started in the beginning of 2018 and we didn't launch it until 2021 end of 2020 is when we launched it and then put people through it in 2021. And it's yielded this kind of year long intensive training on cannabis quality, cannabis assessment, and then cannabis service. Those are the kind of three pillars of Ganjie is understanding quality, understanding how to assess the quality and understanding how that translates into service to consumers. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I'm going to pause on that because we'll we'll pick that up as the main topic in a minute. My next question is related to some of the things that you talked about. And it's great that you've got these hookups with some really great universities. It adds legitimacy to everything that you're doing. How much are you working with industry? Ultimately, those are the guys that are going to be recognizing the quality of the education that you're giving and the certifications. How is that relationship working out? It's funny you ask that because, you know, as we've been building everything one step at a time, we did have this realization that unless industry embraced this, it wouldn't matter. And so, I mean, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but that kind of conclusion didn't really come front and center in my mind until just a few years ago. And so a few years ago, we started to really say we have to tackle industry adoption. So that led me to build another department of the company that was focused purely on working with the cannabis industry, you know, the the companies themselves to not just make them aware of what we were doing, but to really push the importance and the value of education. And that actually yielded a whole new division of the company that now works with cannabis companies on their own internal training platforms. And so that's a business unit. But the origin story of why we went down that was actually to make industry aware of the importance and the value of education. And so, yeah, now, you know, now we have hundreds of the largest MSOs in the country, as well as many of the smaller kind of craft players that we either work with to provide training for their own people internally, you know, it's kind of where they're onboarding training or where they're certification training, but also, you know, a big secondary intention for me to build that department was simply to make sure all the companies in the space were aware of the value and importance of education. And, you know, the it's not a very difficult sell. It's just more the recognition that cannabis is extremely complex And that means that if you want people to be successful, they need to have good education and training to play that role successfully. So whether they were able to get talent from the schools or Gangier that came with pre-existing training, or they were hiring people from the outside and then putting them through our training internally, that was going to help them with their business. And fortunately, that thesis has proven out that you know, better trained people stay in the job longer. They contribute more deeply to the organization. They are, quite frankly, better team members, and they are able to operate in compliance and in health and safety protocols that that align with the cannabis industry. So that part of the business and making industry aware is still fairly young. And I feel like we have a huge way to go to get industry to really see and embrace it, but we are actively working on it. Yeah, fantastic. And I guess that dialogue will be ongoing because it's so nascent. Businesses are learning more about their customers as well and and probably coming to you at some point and saying, listen, we need our guys to know more of this and more of that, less of this or whatever it is. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the thing that everybody that's on the inside knows, but people on the outside don't really understand is that the cannabis industry is so damn complex. I mean, the plant itself has such an enormous diversity of options for how you use it. I mean, you know, our best analog that people reference is alcohol, but alcohol is is a drink, right? And that there's a lot of sophistication. I mean, I don't want to diminish the sophistication that goes into making alcoholic beverages, but it's still one form factor. Cannabis is 
you know, it's drinkable, it's smokable, it's vaporizable, it's tincturable, it's an edible, it's, you know, sublingual, it's a patch, it's a cream. There's all these form factors, you know, and so as a product type, it's already 10 times more complex than alcohol is. But then you add into that, nobody's drinking alcohol for their medicinal purposes. So you have to then factor in the fact that, that people are using cannabis in this incredibly diverse range of applications on top of that. And then you add into the fact the compliance and the regulations and the health and safety requirements and the stringency in which it takes to operate a legal cannabis business. And there's that level of complexity. And then you add into that the fact that if any of these companies are expanding, you know, every region and every state is a totally different marketplace. And so you have to learn and understand the dynamics of the cannabis industry and the supply chain. And that's all of that, in my mind, is just knowledge to get started. <laughs> right. So you can see like, OK, there's a lot to learn here if you want to play successfully in this space. Yeah, yeah, it's just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? And you start thinking about international as well. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But that's brilliant. Thank you for kind of describing that. I guess just before we move on to the specifics around craft cannabis, how has COVID treated your various operations? Well, <laughs> good and bad. You know, digital education has been one of the very few sectors that has had great adoption during COVID. And so I feel a thousand percent certain that there's no way I would be sitting here telling you that we have partnerships with 15 universities had COVID not happened. So that's amazing for us as a business. It's also been, you know, devastatingly difficult. I mean, we had to shutter all our offices. We had to lay off our whole production staff. We had to make some pretty significant changes to the team. We went through a lot of pain to adjust and adapt to this new environment on top of the fact that I'm just kind of a sensitive being. And so the global challenges of the world have kind of affected me personally. And, you know, of course, all the other personal layers of stuff, I've had friends die or get really sick and all sorts of stuff that have happened. So I think that I can compartmentalize, you know, it's been good for one part of the business, and I'm grateful for that. But, you know, like everybody, I feel like COVID has been incredibly disruptive and challenging. And I have a a tremendous amount of, of empathy towards the difficulties that we're facing as a global population in the midst of all this stuff. So good and bad. Yeah, that's a very kind of balanced way of looking at it. And, you know, not to dwell on the other stuff, but I'm glad to hear that the green flower has been sort of has done quite well. You know, education is key to most things, I think. So it's great what you're doing. So let's drill down a bit on craft cannabis. I mean, look, we're in Europe here. We're very, very medical and we're a million miles away from what you guys are doing there. But I do personally think this is a super interesting area for flower and I think where it's going to go. But why don't we take a you know step right back and talk about what exactly is craft cannabis? Well, and I think the reason we're having this conversation is because it's so relevant to Ganjier, right? And I think that it's important to understand that cannabis is a product that is quite difficult to produce in terms of high quality. And so that's the first thing to understand is it's, it's not just like you get some ingredients and you mix these ingredients together and it produces this great product. It's that to grow really high quality cannabis is about the genetics. It's about the growing conditions. It's about the care that you bring to every step of that process. It's about understanding how to deal with pests and diseases in a you know healthy way. It's about understanding the right time to harvest the plant. It's about understanding once you harvest the plant the right way to cure it. It's about understanding the processing methodology that goes into it. It's about understanding the ingredients that must be there to maintain its humidity. There's all these factors that go into simply producing the product. And that's what craft cannabis is, is it's the understanding of all these nuances that go into making a product high quality. And then it's about understanding all the nuances of the of the flower itself. And so in Ganjie, you know, one of the things that we spent, this is actually what took the most time, was developing this systematic assessment protocol, we call it the SAP, which is a protocol, a 33-point protocol for assessing cannabis flower and concentrates. And in that assessment, there is basically, I mean, there's four 
fields, but there's a fifth field, which is like the fifth field is like, you know, how it was grown and when it was harvested and, you know, whether there was lab results provided and all this other stuff that, that go into kind of assessing cannabis. But if you take out that and you just take the four categories, there's a an appearance category, there's an aroma category, there's a flavor category, and then there's an effect category. And I'll break these things down to understand why this is important and what why this makes craft cannabis craft cannabis. Because, you know, I think I said this before, but there is a, a dirty secret in the cannabis industry. I mean, because there's lots of them, but one of the other big dirty secrets is that most of the cannabis product in legal markets is, you know, it's kind of crap. It's not very good quality. And it's because a lot of the the legal producers, and not all of them, but a lot of the legal producers you know, they don't come from cannabis. They come from banking or they come from finance or they come from big agriculture or they come from all these other sectors. And so, you know, you're doing the things that kind of mechanically grow the product, but there's a lot of nuance that goes into really creating tremendous quality craft cannabis. And so we need to train people to look for and understand what, what are these elements. So if you look at appearance, aroma, flavor, and experience, that will give you a gauge of what is the quality of that product? And so you go through each appearance, you start looking at things like trichome density, you know, the amount of trichomes that are on that and the denseness of that. You look at trichome intactness. How are those trichomes heads? Because actually what, you know, again, people don't always understand, but all of the THC and the cannabinoids and the terpenes and the flavors they all rest in the oil molecules, which are basically the heads that sit on the top of these molecules that grow out of the plant. And they're very fragile, very, very fragile. And so in the trimming process, in the handling process, in the packaging process, those heads can get very easily broken off. And that will significantly decrease the quality of that product. So you inspect you know, using this little jeweler's loop that we give all of our ganjiers, you inspect the flower and you rate it, you know, going down this criteria to look at the, the visual appearance of it. Then there's the aroma of it. And you have to actually understand what makes for aromas. And right. And that's where we start to get really deep into terpenes. And you really start to understand these essential oils. And the, what one of the things that was quite eye-opening in working with the scientists and the botanists and the, the people that we worked with to develop this is that there's basically four classes of terpenes. I should say there's four classes of groupings that the vast majority of cannabis can fall under. There's a, a fuel category, there's a fruit category, there's a floral category, and there's an earth category. And so we have to train people on what are the terpenes that go into those categories? What are the cultivars, and we call them strains, but what are the cultivars that are often synonymous with those profiles? And then you have to train the nose. You actually have to train the nose to be able to smell these flowers or this concentrate and to be able to determine, oh, this is, you know, a fuel category, you know, this is a fuel class. Then you can start to rate, you know, we rate things like the not only the class of the, the terpenes, but you rate the complexity of the aroma, the potency of the aroma, the enjoyment of the aroma. You know, you kind of go through this methodical process of understanding the aroma classification of cannabis. But then, you know, take it another step. You realize that smelling it, again, is different than tasting it. And that was a big part of debate is that you had to actually have a whole separate category for the experience once you actually consume it. And so that that goes to things like mouthfeel, <laughs> you know, it goes to things like the potency, that goes to things like the lingering, how long it lingers on the palate, that goes into things like the dry hit, <laughs> that goes into things like all these kind of experiences that you have in terms of the actual flavor once you're consuming the product. And then there's this fourth category, which is totally unique to cannabis, not in wine, not in chocolate, not in any other, quite frankly, any other category, which is that, you know, people are also consuming cannabis because it has this wide diversity of different effect profiles, right? And so you're now gauging, is it a mental effect? Is it a physical effect? Is it uplifting? Is it relaxing? Does it have a long duration? What kind of finish does it have? You know, sometimes the finish is either very heavy or the finish is 
quite smooth and almost unnoticeable. And you use all this kind of data, if you will, to aggregate a total score. And the point of all this is, first and foremost, is hopefully to start to really give a voice to craft cannabis so that when it's real quality, it's acknowledged because that's part of the issue right now is that there's so little differentiation in the marketplace that craft cannabis is just getting drowned out, right? So one part was to acknowledge when a real high quality product is truly high quality, but also to take away or to accurately grade the products that might be touting as quality but are actually crap and have an objective scoring system to be able to remove those things. And, you know, our general hope is that by training more of these professionals, it kind of has an impact across that supply chain. You know, if if the grading is telling the suppliers that this is not high quality enough or we're not going to buy it or we're not going to pay for that, you know, they will elevate their standards a bit to grow higher quality product and vice versa. The craft producers that are doing that will get recognized and properly valued in the marketplace and properly distributed. So that's a long-winded answer of getting you to what is craft cannabis and how we've kind of gone about tackling that from a ganji standpoint. That is a superb answer there. I love it. And there's so much there. First of all, I really want to do this course. This sounds amazing. It's amazing. (laughs) It's remarkable how much it sounds similar to wine as well in the way, just the way you describe it. I mean, you, you did use the sommelier analogy, so a lot of that does make sense. I guess before we get onto that aspect of it, one of the things that struck me when you were talking about the distinction between quality cannabis and a lot of the stuff that's available is scale something to do with it. I think, you know, people basically trying to economize and grow as much as you can as quickly as you can. And in like in the same way that in any industry, when you industrialize it, the quality generally goes down versus when it's handmade. Is it that kind of situation? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a place for Budweiser, right? There's a place for Budweiser. The scary thing, though, is that in many regions, not everywhere, cannabis industry is looking like a lot of Budweiser clones. And that's the problem is that the majority of cannabis consumers, especially the cannabis consumers that are consuming the most, they are people that like quality cannabis. I think that's that's one of the different things between a Budweiser drinker and a cannabis, you know, a, a heavy cannabis user is a heavy cannabis user wants quality. A heavy cannabis user wants to really have these diverse flavors and smells, and they are not going to be satisfied with drinking Budweiser. And so, you know, we were talking offline. That's why the black market continues to thrive so powerfully is that the people that are consuming the most cannabis, they don't want to smoke crap. You know, they want to smoke stuff that that really is going to match their love of the plant. And right now it's becoming increasingly difficult to find quality in the legal markets because people are going this like mass scale production route, but it's not going to end well for anybody. (laughs) You know, the companies are, that's why they're, the companies are not necessarily succeeding as they go these massive scales. And that's why the consumers are flocking to the illicit market because it's the only way to find craft products that you can really have that level of nuanced quality. Yeah, and nuance is a very key word there. I mean, one of the aspects that you were talking about was effects. And I mean, I guess all of the different buckets that you look at have an element of subjectivity to it. But I suppose effects maybe are the most subjective. How do you kind of tackle that issue? Are they a cultivars generally shown to show certain aspects to most people? Is that the kind of approach? So in this SAP protocol, Everything is graded except for the effect profiles because of that very reason that that it's more subjective. Now, that said, there somebody who's now built the program used the protocol to test, I don't know if I'd say thousands of samples, but but easily hundreds, definitely easily hundreds. You can get pretty darn accurate with your understanding of the terpene profiles, and the most likely direction of where those are going to go. For example, you know, heavily gassy strains are a combination of myrcene beta caryophylline. That's the primary terpene class that makes that gassiness. Well, especially in higher proportions of myrcene with slower proportions of beta caryophylline, you can damn well guarantee that's going to be a really heavy strain. It's going to have a downward kind of mobility effect to it. And vice versa, you know, there's some of these 
you know, very kind of uh, pining dominant profiles that are w- kind of woodsy by nature or these very lemony, citrusy profiles where those are lemonine, beta caryophylline dominant profiles. And, and you can look at the lab results to know that those are the predominance of terpenes that are in those and those are going to have a very uplifting quality to them. Same thing with like terpenaline as an example. They have a more uplifting kind of energy to them. And so while we understood that there's a subjectivity to this and that is one of the reasons why you know the effects itself are not graded um qualitatively you can get pretty darn accurate you know with at least this is going to be more uplifting or this is going to be a little bit heavier by its nature and that's also why in the systematic assessment protocol you know it's generating this individualized report you know i rated this strain and my direct experience of this is that it, you know, had this kind of mental effect and this kind of physical effect and it gives you some gauge. And so it won't it won't be as accurate, quite frankly, as all the other measures of quality that go through that SAP process. It still gives you a thousand times more educated perspective to guide people forward than have not having those things. So that's how we kind of tackled that subjectivity issue around the experience. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, again, it's really interesting how the terpenes are almost like the tasting notes of a wine when you're tasting wine. Well, except for with the the biggest caveat, and again, this is it's there is some crossover in wine. And as a side note, we we spent a lot of time talking with sommeliers, breaking down the sommelier certification process, looking at how they created sommeliers, and modeled a lot of Gangier after that process. But there was some absolute breakdowns. And some of those breakdowns are that cannabis quality can really significantly impact the experience that you have with cannabis. And meaning, you know, a $15 bottle of wine, you might be a wine aficionado and be like, well, I can tell that this is not a $100 bottle of wine. But you're not going to drink that and be like, oh, this is terrible. I mean, I guess maybe you would, but you probably wouldn't. Whereas if you're a cannabis person, you know, for me out here, anytime I buy legal weed now and I, you know, put it through my senses, I'm like, I would never buy this again. This is terrible. You know, I would never buy this again. And so it's not just the terpenes. The terpenes are certainly a very important part of it. But, you know, if the trichome heads are broken off, if it's been overly trimmed, if it was not cured properly, if the moisture's all gone, all those factors pretty dramatically change the experience of cannabis. And that's, again, something that's unique that people have to understand. It's not just about, you know, any one individual element. It's all those factors combined that actually make for quality cannabis versus not quality cannabis. Yeah, there's a lot goes into it. So if I can drill down on one issue that I perceive, actually, I'm obviously not in an adult use kind of jurisdiction, but I often want to speak to clients in the States as well and Canada. There seems to be a bit of an obsession on THC percentage as almost like one of the key purchasing decisions. And that's kind of very crude, isn't it, If as an assessment? How do you see that versus all of the wonderful other qualities? It's a terrible measure. It's a terrible, terrible measure. And again, what we now know after going through this process with so many different samples is that people don't realize the higher, so only certain genetics are able to produce that quantity of THC under the right conditions. So what's happening right now is that there's a very narrow form of product that is being maximized to produce the highest potential THC. But unfortunately, what happens for that is first off, the terpenes in those are very boring because there's not a lot of room for those products to produce diversity when you're just maximizing this one individual genetic expression, THC. So unfortunately, because cannabis is so expensive in the legal market, you know, it makes sense why consumers want the most bang for their buck. I I don't blame the consumers, but it's very short-sighted of the industry to favor this high THC-based production if we're trying to create an industry of you know, quality, if you will. And so there's just so many issues with high THC as the marker. One, you know, we now know kind of unequivocally that if that's what you're going for, you're going to lose many other aspects that go into quality cannabis. And the truth is, you know, lots of people that love cannabis will 
notice that that's not what they like over time and they won't necessarily keep buying that product. So there's not necessarily a ton of, you know, consumer loyalty per se in that experience. But also it's just that it's just so short sighted, you know, it's so short sighted in terms of building a, an industry, if you will. So there is still a lot of people that are producing for high THC, but I'm hoping that with Kanjie, we can kind of educate both the professionals as well as the professionals to educate the consumers that it doesn't yield better products. It's like the joke we always say. It's like you don't go to the liquor store and ask for a hundred proof because you're looking for the best product, you know? I mean, that's exactly the analogy, isn't it? And it's it's a very narrow metric. And, you know, you can have a number of different experiences from cannabis. One may be very physical, and but one could be giggly, one could be whatever. And they all involve different, <laughs> a lot of different ingredients than just high THC. So, And, you know, like a lot of the people that were on the Ganji Council developing this were the judges at the Emerald Cup or judges at High Times Cup. And one of the things that they continuously communicated to us is that never in the history of any of those cups did the highest THC products win the awards. It never. It was always the products that had the more diverse terpene profiles or the better cure or the, you know, more interesting appearances. And it was all those other factors that actually caused the products to be rated and judged as a consensus in the highest possible way. And so, you know, it's this, like many things in the cannabis industry, there's a little bit of a disconnect from, you know, what some people are doing and what the greater industry is kind of wanting or looking for, or, or I should say what's better for the greater sector of the industry to develop into is probably what I would say. Yeah, much, much richer experiences are available, basically. <laughs> so cool. As we round this out, maybe you're very central to the space in the US and, you know, you're very prominent on social media and, and sharing your thoughts. What are your thoughts for 2022 in the cannabis industry? I mean, I'm a bit worried that it's going to be more of the same right now. I don't think from a federal standpoint, there's going to be any movement at all. And so I think that we're kind of in this deadlock in a federal space. I do think states are going to continue to legalize. I mean, I imagine that we'll have five plus more states that will come online this year. So the markets will continue to expand. You know, there's some big issues happening in many places. California is an absolute total mess. And I am not certain about how that's going to play out right now, truth be told, you know, because it's hard enough to do reform in cannabis in general, but you add on top of it the you know, political climate and the pandemic that we're in, and it just makes these issues go really painfully slow. So I think that we're just in for more of the same for this next coming year, quite frankly. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I don't see a lot of change happening. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, that's not what I'm hearing either. So yeah, it's it's not great. But let's focus on the positives. If you think five more are going to join the join the club over the next year, let's, that that's got to be a good thing. Well, and there's, I mean, there's a few things I've learned now being in the cannabis industry for she's going on seven years. Is that cannabis surprises me constantly. So even though I say all that stuff, I would wouldn't be surprised if there were some big surprises this year. Secondly, we have to acknowledge that there is an absolute like record smashing number of cannabis consumers coming online these days. You know, as people deal with the pandemic and as they're stuck at home and as they're, you know, kind of more isolated from the world, people are choosing to to consume cannabis or explore cannabis more. And so we're seeing an absolute record number of new consumers, which I believe as a plant medicine guy is the best thing that could happen. You know, I just think that's an amazing evolution for society. And, you know, and outside of that, I think we'll, we'll kind of just keep fighting the good fight together and trying to move this thing along. So I think there's a lot of good collaboration happening in the space. Yeah. And a great way to end the episode. Thank you, Max. Really good to catch up with you. And, and I love the sound of everything that you're doing. And hopefully one day I can make it out to Cali and say hello and maybe get to join you on the course. <laughs> you should. It is one of the funnest experiences I've ever had, you know, doing this Ganjie program. You you develop a relationship with the plant that is unmatched. It's so, you know, you become so intimate with all these things. So I'd love to have you. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it, Max. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. 
If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.